Um, hello and welcome back to a View from the Bullens. We're here today with me, Luke Davis. Hopefully you've seen a little bit more of me soon. We're also here with Lee McLean and Paul Draper. And we're going to be discussing the weekend's event, especially Everton and a little bit extra. So initially, what's your thoughts on the result? 2-2, you know, what do you think? Nice to see you, Luke, by the way. Welcome <laughs> aboard. Um, you must be mad. Um, I don't Listen, I think before the game, it was another one of them fixtures where you're heading into it thinking... Everton are probably underdogs with the bookies. We would have been underdogs coming up against, we said it before the game, a really good Tottenham side, full of quality, going well in the Premier League. Everton are probably a little bit, well, very depleted at the minute, probably running on empty. Uh, there's players who are probably struggling a little bit. Um, and it's been highlighted before the game, our, our lack of goals and you know lack of that clinical touch is harming us. Um, we talked at length about the, the striker situation last week. So it was, it was one of them probably heading into the game at had taken a point. But as is often the case, when you draw a game, I think the manner in which you get a point and other results around you probably dictate how good a point you ultimately think yeah. it's been. So when you look at that, obviously we've, for the first time in a while, it seems like a while we've scored like a decisive late goal, which is always good. We haven't seen one of them at the, at the Gladys Street for a while where we've secured a point. I don't think anyone, I think you'd be hard pushed to say Everton weren't fully worthy of at least a point on the day. Um, I said before we came on here, I think over the course of the two games against Spurs, who, who are a really good side, like I've said before, I think we've acquitted ourselves well. And some may argue we've probably been the better side across the two games. Maybe a little bit unlucky not to come away with four points from those two games. Um, but for all the quality Spurs have, and the fact that I think second half... Everton did dip. I think we did look tired. I think we were really, really it was really showing that the players were certain players were running on, on empty and the lack of options were probably hurting us off the bench. Um, Tottenham, I can't recall causing us. It, it wasn't relentless. It wasn't a backs against the wall point. Um, I think we had our chances again, and when we did did equalise, it was a sense of we've got what we deserve there rather than a smash and grab. Yeah. And we've nicked one from from Tottenham. Um, I think they had opportunities as well in the second half. That Werner had that chance where he seemingly never looked like he was going to score, even though he's one on one, which mm -hmm. is a good save. But Charleston had another one that went over. So, mm -hmm. but I agree. I think on the balance of the game, I think the first half was Spurs, the second half was Everton's, and I yeah. think two two is probably a fair result overall. Yeah, probably on reflection, it's probably a decent yeah. a decent point. Um, we'll probably come on and talk a little bit about the other results after the game. But again, your mood's just affected slightly when when you people around you are taking unexpected points or, or, or three points from their fixtures. But, I mean, from from me personally speaking, I, I, I still feel really aggrieved that we're even talking in in, in, in these in, in this way or having to talk in this way because if we if we hadn't have had the 10 points taken off us, we're not even in these conversations. We're not worrying about what Luton or Forrest or whoever else are doing because we're yeah. not even in that conversation, but we are. And that's what's causing a lot of anxiety. But overall, another decent performance in difficult situation players running on empty, players out who we need back quickly, players still not finding full form, especially in, in attacking areas. So you take the point at the end of the day for me. Yeah, so would you echo uh, Lee's thoughts or would you have a little bit of a different perspective on that? Um, I thought Evan started slowly the game. I think obviously you can see that early on, I think three or four minutes in Richardson with a really good finish. I remember that touched uh, in the pre-match over on the page and I thought... Tottenham's biggest strength was going to be the space in behind Godfrey. I think his position is something that that worries me a bit. And I think both, both their goals came down down our right hand side, cutting it back. And then obviously the second one's a really, really fantastic finish from Richardson from the outside of the box. But I think obviously Everton got into the game slowly. It took us a bit of time, but then we settled into the game, managed to press space high, win the ball back high. Uh, create a few chances, a few opportunities, obviously, then we find ourselves with a goal from a set piece, which we were, were really, really threatening throughout throughout the game on set pieces. I felt uh, Vicario, he, he couldn't cope and he got bullied on set pieces and I think on crosses, which we really, really targeted. I think Spurs average, uh, I think it's 20 crosses a game they can see or something and we just doubled that. We just peppered them with crosses. Yeah. But yeah, I think overall... Happy with the point, first half. Unlucky to go in 2-1 down, I think. And second half, I, th I disagree. I think we we look tired. I think we look lethargic. I think we look sloppy. We look leggy. And until Sean Dyche didn't make the change, I think Spurs were really 
cruising to a 2-1 victory. And they, pro they probably should have put the game together. I think Jordan Pickford made two or three really, really good saves like he always does. I remember one from, I think it was Pedro Porro. He really made a really good save. It was near post. Porro got quite a lot of pace and power behind that. But we dug deep. This is what these players do. They'll dig deep. They'll fight. They'll keep going. And once the changes came on, I think it was especially Yusuf Chimiti and Lewis Dobbin, who I thought had a real impact in the game, the young lad Dobbin on the wing. He was taking Porro on. He was putting cross. He put a really good in cross for Chimiti. You can, should, you'd can, argue we should probably do better with that finish. Then if he's offside or not, and gets checked. But we kept we kept winning set pieces, corners. We were we were causing trouble from them. And then obviously in 94th minute, you get that set piece from which Sean Dyche got booked before it, which was a mad one. So obviously now he misses that City game. Yeah. And you just put it in the mixer. Romero heads it towards his own goal and Jared Branthwaite's there to Heather Oman, send the Gladys Street into what pff, the Gladys Street does best, which is go mad. But yeah, I think overall it's a good point. Obviously, you if you'd have asked me before the game, would you take a weekend where nothing has changed? So no one's no one's gained points on you, I think I would have I would have definitely took that before the game. Yeah, I think there's a few um, topics to unpack there. What you mentioned, obviously you mentioned Chimiti, you've mentioned the right hand side. So first go to you, Lee. What's your sort of thoughts on Chimiti, a nineteen year old lad come over from Portugal? Obviously difficult to adapt, but he has been scoring quite a lot of goals for the under twenty ones. Mm -hmm. How would you analyze his start to Everton? Um, I think the situation I said this the other week, I think the situation Everton finds ourselves in probably doesn't help in terms of we're all of a sudden we're under a little bit of pressure again. And I don't think that lends itself too well to a, a young lad who, in all honesty, was probably brought in with one eye on the future. Yeah. We all said that when we signed him. It's probably one of these that you're looking to blood in the under-21s, perhaps give a couple of loans to, um, drop a couple of uh, minutes in in the, in the League Cup or you know at the end of games. Uh, I don't think anyone ever thought he was going to come in and become like a, a first-team regular or a fixture in the first team straight away. But as time's gone on, um, you know, unfortunately, I think Beto struggled at times, um, mm. you know, for, for form. Um, Dominic Calvert-Lewin has. Um, Dice has obviously taken the, the decision to stick with Calvert-Lewin and hope that he plays his way out of this spell of form and, and 17 games now without a goal, unfortunately. Um, so it may be a case where Chimiti starts getting a, a few more chances because when he's come on, he does look lively. He looks he looks pacey, he looks energetic. Still very, very raw. You know, he's by no means the, the finished finished article. Um, but whenever he has come on, I agree, he's impressed. Um, it may be the case. I'm just getting the sense now in the last few weeks that Beto's performances in particular probably could mean is he number two now behind Dominic Calvert Lewin? Is he start gonna get gonna start getting more chances as in the central forward position. I think if you look at Dobbin, I think you're seeing more of him now as a as a wide player. Um, you know, an option on the left from the left or the right. Um and for me, when I was watching the game at the weekend, at, on seventy minutes, Everton were dead on the feet. And I, I agree with Paul, it just looked like we were limping towards a it was just gonna play out into a two one or three one defeat. Yeah. And I was like, make a change, make a change now. And this is obviously the criticism that's been one of the few criticisms that's been labelled at Dice and that is reluctant to, to make substitutions early enough. I would have liked to have seen Dobbin come on on 60 minutes with those legs and that energy and give Tottenham something to, to worry about for a longer period of time because every time we went at Tottenham, they look vulnerable at the back. We've created so many chances against them in, the, in those two games. So did really well. Again, very unlucky not to come away with an assist at um, Dobbin I'm talking about here because yeah. I think Chimiti could have done a little bit better. Um, but the pair of them really liven things up and freshen things up and we looked better when they came on even though it was like 10 minutes yeah I think from watching the under 21s I think we've kind of got with them two players Dobbin and Chimiti you've got two players that they're not quite ready to start every week for the first team but they're miles better than the rest of the under 21s especially Dobbin like I've watched him at Walton Hall Park a few times he's like dancing around defenders he's levels above and we've seen little aspects of that in the game against Spurs but it's whether he can now do that for the 90 minutes because he scored that goal against Chelsea and he thought, oh, that'll be a real lift off for him. But he hasn't really done much since. He hasn't really been given that much of a chance. I don't know what you think about. 53 minutes, he said. Since yeah. We talked about it last week. He's had 53 minutes since that goal and, and 45 of that 53 was the second half against Burnley away. Yeah. So it's like eight minutes. He hasn't really been given a chance, has he? 
Yeah, and then the other top of the one is one pack was you mentioned the, the right hand side. Like, what do you think's next for for Nathan Patterson? Because obviously you've got Coleman there, Young can play there, Godfrey on the weekend. It's sort of anyone but Nathan Patterson at the moment. Well, I think we've had this discussion for a long time, especially over on over on the page. We Sean Dyche clearly doesn't trust Nathan Patterson at this moment in time. Whether you feel that's fair or not fair, I think that's that's a discussion, a different discussion. I think there's been chan- there's been times where Nathan probably deserved a, more of a chance or a run of games. He hasn't had uh, the best start to his ever career that he would have imagined. Obviously, he's had a few injuries, especially last season. This season, when he has been fit, he hasn't really featured. Um, I mean, right now, for Dyche, is he is he Evans' fourth choice right back behind Coleman, Ashley Young, and even centre half who was rumoured to be leaving the club in the in the January window in Ben Godfrey. Yeah, it it's difficult, and we've said he needs minutes. He needs he needs time. He can't. He has got aspects to his game where he can be a valuable asset to Everton. May that be playing or improving out on loan and then being sold or whatever maybe he has got attributes to become a valuable asset to this football club but for me personally in this moment in time he, he's not he's not good enough to play in the Premier League in, in the predicament that we're in I think on a Dice team especially he's not good enough defensively for me I think he switches off too much and I don't think he offers you as much going forward to kind of risk that defensive weakness that would that will come into the team. It's not like, for example, when you go to all the right backs and they're brilliant. For example, Michalenko, let's say, he's fantastic defensively, but he's not as good going forward. But as as he is that good defensively, he counters his his weakness going forward. So you can kind of you kind of risk not having as much of a threat going forward with with Michalenko at left back. And for me, Patterson doesn't bring that. As I've said, as every day of the week that Coleman's fit, he should start forever, and in this in this side because he is for me right now the best the best possible right back we have and I think you saw when he came on the other day just his experience and his know how of the game how we managed it and Ashley Young last few performances at right wing he's been really really solid I think that time where he was out injured probably helped him to get a bit more to to rest up a bit because he was running he was running on low I think he was playing a lot of games for his age and he's come out and said he wants to play next season so he'll be down down to the club to see if they give him a new deal. Yeah, what, what do you think sort of the the solution for, for Nathan Patterson? Because he can't just sit on the bench, he's gonna halt his progression. Um, I don't know. Um I've I've been a really big fan of Nathan Patterson. I agree with Paul. I think there is a player there. Um and he might just be a victim of circumstance. I funnily enough, there was a clip on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it this morning, showing highlights of the five three game against Blackpool. Yeah. If you remember it. And I think for Blackpool's third goal, you see a young Seamus Coleman, 2011, so he'd been with us two years, and he makes a horrific howler. And it wasn't uncommon back then. I think he was very raw himself, and he and he wasn't a polished diamond in terms of defensively Seamus Coleman when he first came in. But what he had, we had the luxury of much better attacking talent. He was playing in an Everton side that had more possession. There wasn't as much reliance to be absolutely solid and do your job because we've got this acceptance that we're not the most expansive or gifted or creative team going forward. So I think Paul's right. I just think it's a trust issue. Sean Dyche needs to know that the four or five, wherever he goes with defenders at the back, are going to be able to play in the way he wants them to play, are going to be able to contain, are going to be able to remain disciplined and switched on for nine. It's it's 100 minutes these days. Yeah and not allow themselves that lapse in concentration. Because as much as I like Nathan Patterson from, I think, his, his physicality, how, how athletic he is, I love the, the Glaswegian in him, I love the fact that he's a bit snidey and he's in people's faces. All of those are, are, are boxes ticked. And when we've been on good runs of form and he's been playing and we and confidence is up, he looks a much better player. But when our backs are against the wall a little bit, that's when I worry about Nathan Patterson. And that's when I think Sean Dice looks at it and goes, no, I need a steady Eddie. I need someone I can absolutely rely on to form part of that back four. So I just think at the minute, it's just not happening situational-wise for Nathan Patson. I think probably alone in the summer because our situation could change quite quickly. You know, So what type of club do you think alone now? Another Premier League team, abroad, a championship team? Is I that too low of a level? I th- yeah, I think championship would be too low of a level. Um, you know, maybe, maybe going abroad, you know, you look at um, success stories of people who have gone abroad and come back and done really well, testing themselves in another league. 
know, that that could be uh, a shout. Ultimately, that's down to the club and that's down to Nathan Patterson. Yeah. But right now, I can't see between now and the end of the season him really getting back into the fold from like a first team regular point of view. Because I think we've now got with the emergence of Ben Godfrey as an option at right back. I just think there's too many people in front of him. Would you say Ben Godfrey is a better option than Nathan Patterson? Um, it's hard to say. I think they're very, very different players, aren't they? Yeah. Like massively different. But what I will say is Ben Godfrey is probably a better defender. But I also see the point that some people make is that he makes himself look better because a lot of the time he's correcting his own mistakes. So he gets caught out, but he's got that recovery pace and he's got that like agility where he looks really good. Yobo was the same. Um, but he's given the manager something to think about because he's come in and he's applied himself really well. And he's a beast as well. And he's physical. And to me, he just looks and comes across more as a, as a Sean Dice player than Patterson does. Yeah, so that, that's sort of the final call on the on Everton's game of the weekend. But obviously the surrounding results have a big effect on us now when the position we're in. So first of all, Newcastle for Luton for what do you think, Paul? Well, I mean, don't know what don't know where Luton are pulling these these goals out from here. Uh, obviously I think going into the weekend you thought, okay, yeah, that's a game where you'd expect Newcastle to, to win their a solid outfit at home. I think they got quite a few players back, although they haven't been performing maybe to the best of their ability lately, but the solid at home, Luton maybe don't have that comfort of playing at at their home pitch tight, make it horrible for them like they did against Brighton. But and when they take the lead, Newcastle you think, okay, yeah, they'll cruise now, maybe two, three nil win. But credit to Luton, they just don't stop believing and they don't stop fighting and they're not going away anytime soon. It doesn't seem to think obviously they've got Ross Barkley in midfield who's pff, playing the football of his life. I think he hasn't played this level of football since since Martin has his first year at Everton probably and he's kinda made himself kinda change his game. He's obviously plays more deeper now. He controls the game more instead of being that powerful number ten that would just burst through with runs into the box, leaving one or two players behind and and having a shot from distance and now he just controls the game much more and he seems to be making much better decisions on the ball. But Luton will be disappointed to not come away with three points. I think that's them two Newcastle goals are quite big in the in the fight. I think um, they'll they may have had a bit of a a bit of a kick with that because they thought okay we beat Brighton four 0 now we're four two up at Newcastle. You'd expect them to to win that game really. I think with twenty minutes to go or so, you will. But it's one of them. This is the Premier League. Anything can happen. As as again as we've seen with Luton, they're not going anywhere. I think. The weekend for Luton is a big game because I think one of my mates made a good point. It's the first time in the Premier League Luton have got they're expected to win the game. They're not they're not gonna be obviously underdogs as they have been really all season. They've got Sheffield United at home. And you expect Sheffield United to kind of play the way that Luton would want to play, sit deep, make it horrible, try and nick one in a set piece or long balls, Chris Wilder with obviously three centre halves and It'll be interesting, obviously, you expect Luton to win due to Sheffield United. They've been, they've been poor, again, 4-5-0 down the other day at half-time. It, they, they've been real poor, I think, when they lost. I think it was NDI and Sanderberg early in the window, in the summer window, you just thought, they're not going to replace these, they're, they're bang in trouble. And Chris Wilder, although they got, they got beat heavily the weekend, he's brought them a bit of... Proud back, obviously, he knows what it, what it is to manage Sheffield United. He's, he's Sheffield United through and through, and and he's he's managed them successfully in the Premier League that first season when they came up and they were really, really solid until COVID, until COVID hit. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch that game, but with Luton, they're not going nowhere anytime soon. Yeah, and obviously then Bournemouth won, Forest won. Not the, not the biggest result, not the worst result, so mm -hmm. how do you unpack that one, Lee? I, I didn't watch the game uh, and I've not, not really seen the highlights, but um, I get, yeah, it, Luton's the one everyone's talking about, with, but with Forrest, I still think they're very much in the mix. I think them, Crystal Palace are the ones who are dropping like a stone uh, at the minute as well. 24 points, but can't, can't seem to buy a win. There's a lot of uproar around the manager. Um, Forrest are a funny one because we go there, deservedly come away with a 1-0. They're awful at the back. Um, but they just they've got power players and they've got players who if they hit streaks of form you can see them winning home games and stuff like that. So it's, there's going to be ebbs and flows. There's going to be weekends where results go for us, results go against us. It's still 
grating on me that we're even having this discussion again for the third year running. It's becoming really tiresome having to worry about the, the these sort of results. But I think with these teams, the the Luton as as the example, they're in a purple patch. This is their little run. But it, it, in all reality, if you look at their ability over the course of a season, they're not going to be able to sustain this level over the next fifteen games. They're not going to. They're not going to maintain a 60 odd percent win rate if, as, as if you look at the like the last six games that they're on now they're just not they'll run out of steam eventually ross barkley could get injured he could again hit a peak and start to plateau a little bit i think they're relying very heavily on him he is literally making them tick at the minute he's he's the tallies man um and everton don't forget while all this has been going on i've been really hard done to in terms of of injuries i think we've been impacted heavily there um, not being able to bolster the squad in January for obvious reasons, I think that is, is a big blow as well. But we will, I think, I believe, we'll hit another little mini purple patch as well. We've still got that to come. Our fixtures will start looking a little bit kinder again once we get this weekend out of, out of the way. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's us putting pressure on, on the teams down there again. Um, so fair play to Luton. Listen, they've, 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 they were written off absolutely written up by everyone earlier in, in the season um but that man the manager's done a really really good job in that transition from winning every week in the championship and, and coming up and you've got that feel good factor to then getting used to being on the losing side of things most weeks which must be really really difficult to they'll to then regalvanize a group of players and get them going again you know you've got you've got to give them credit but do i think it'll last no probably not um, and if I was a better man putting 50p on it I still think Everton will finish above Luton at the end of the season I'd agree with that I think I think Forrest are the ones where they still look like a Premier League team you've got them little gems of quality Gibbs White will you score a 30 yard scream and they'll win 1-0 at home but I think whereas you look at a Barkley I don't think he's quite at that level although he is in a great vein of form I think he, his, throughout his career he's had a tendency to be in form and then drop out of form mm -hmm. and he just doesn't exist anymore then mm -hmm. for a few mm -hmm. of the games but yeah hopefully Everton do hit another purple patch but I think you've just mentioned then Crystal Palace I think they just seem like a football club in free fall like it's sort of like Roy's on the brink every week of being sacked and he might get an half decent result oh and then he's still there the next week but so what's your thoughts on them Paul like just a caveat that like is, do you think Hodgson will eventually go soon or do you think he's going to hang on till the end of the season? I think the only way uh, Roy hangs on is if they start getting results and unfortunately for him, I don't feel like that's going to happen. I feel like the scenes after the game against Brighton, obviously their biggest their biggest game of the season down in the Amex, it was like when we played Brentford a few years ago, uh, it was just missing the hey dude in the background. <laughs> but the, for me with Palace... They've got players to not be in the fight. I think it, it'll be like it's similar to last season when they were when they were starting to get in. They just chopped, got Roy in, and he just gave them the attacking players freedom to go out and express themselves. The likes of Eze, Elise, uh, Odson, Edwards, and Jeffrey Schlupp, who's, who's a handful. He's just energetic and he doesn't stop running. They got two really good centre halves in Gay and Anderson. I know Gay went off injured the other day against uh, Brighton, which was also. After taking into consideration the injuries they've got, as he's been out, at least he pulled up in his first sprint at half time, and Hudson got a few chance of the fans saying, "You don't know what you're doing." But I think I don't think they'll be there come the end of the season because I think Roy will will go, will be relieved of his duties. They'll get a new manager in, they'll improve in the table, and they'll just it'll just be similar to last season with Palace, where they ended up doing us a favour, beating Leeds late in the season. If if you uh, both remember. But yeah, it's the the playing, the playing the worst football I've seen Palace playing in a long, long time, and that's that's saying something. But they've got the players to get them out of this. When when do you think they do it with Hodgson? Did he wait another five games, or do he do it now to stop the rot, or do he just persist persist with him? Because I think Palace kind of have a little bit of loyalty to him now because he yeah. brought him back. Yeah, it's kind of a similar situation to last time, but the opposite. He's yeah. now in the Vieira position position yeah. where he's gone in and replaced them, but. It's another thing, I think, for managers at the moment as well. It's like, who do you bring in? Potter's being mentioned, but it's like, you're going from their, arguably, the biggest rivals. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how well that's going to go down. Mm -hmm. Will Potter be successful there? I don't know if Crystal Palace suits him as well as a football club. If you look at Brighton, they're more of 
a progressive football club, if you like, a more modern football club. But Palace are very traditional. So mm-hmm. I think Roy suits Palace, but it's just where did he go next and when did he do it? Well, I hope they do it after the 19th of February because um, we've got them after City. Uh, we were speak- I was speaking about this with my mates in, in the pub at the weekend. Um, it's one of them where you want it to either happen now, so the manager's first games this weekend, or after after they play Everton. You don't want that new new manager bounce coming to Goodison. Things have just got very stale with Roy Hodgson. Um, uh, I know they've got you know this high profile fan on on Twitter who's been very vocal. Uh, you know H- yeah, is it HLCO yeah. or whatever. Um, and I think it, it becomes very difficult once you lose the fans. And we've we've seen it as Evertonians. We've seen it a couple of examples of it in in recent history where it then becomes very very difficult for a manager to sustain his position once you lose the fan base and the fan base are actually becoming vocal at games and stuff which is what's starting to happen now um i do think palace have been a little bit unlucky with injuries key players so some of the the, the lads that paul's caught out called out earlier on um i've been i've, I've each been out for periods of time throughout the season and i think that's hurt them a lot because when they're missing these star men there's really not much behind them. I said before we, we came on here that Palace are the worst side I've seen at Goodison for the last couple of years. They, they've been really, really poor, but they are capable of going on yeah. these runs. But I don't think it's going to happen for Roy Hodgson now. I think he's he's come to the end of this journey. He's probably lost the dressing room. He's certainly lost the fans and they need something to inject a little bit of life back into them and these star players to get up and running again. Um, Potter, as for Potter, I think the this going from rival to rival thing is becoming less of a thing. Now, if we look at Pochettino going to Chelsea, for example, you know, ex-Spurs and stuff like that. Mourinho's done something similar. I think if, if a decent job there, and Palace is still a decent... I can think of another one as well, but I'm not going to say yeah, it. I'm not even saying it. <laughs> like, I, I, men in black moment there, it's, it's just being zapped from my memory. I never don't even want to think about it ever again. But if, it's a decent job. It's still an attractive proposition. They've got some good players, haven't they? Um, and the, they've... they've it's still a platform that gives a manager a chance to come in, especially someone like Potter who's wanting to sort of rebuild his reputation a little bit. It could be a good foot in the door for him to come in. Um, I think it'd be a decent appointment for Palace, but if they make it, I just hope it's after the 19th when they play us. Yeah, so two weeks until Palace for us, but first uh, the small matter of Manchester City at the Etihad. So how do you approach this one, Paul? Like, is it is it a free hit? Um, No game really is a free hit. I mean, obviously, if there's anything as close to a free hit as probably Manchester City away, it's it goes without saying it's going to be a monumental task for Everton to to even get anything out of the game. Never mind, never mind win. They're a the fantastic football side. They are in one of the two best best teams in the in the whole world. Never mind, never mind the country. We were they said went we went there last season with. With the worst, with the worst team, probably in terms of obviously, it was a team managed by Frank Lampard. There was, it was a team dysfunctional. It was a team that, that wasn't as solid as this team. It was a team that wasn't as good away from home as a Sean Dyche's team, and we got a point, a well earned point. Not saying where that will happen again the weekend, but it shows that it can be done. I think for how good City are, I think they've looked a bit more shaky this season. Obviously, Kevin De Bruyne is starting to come back, and he's came back in. In amazing form, Erling Haaland is starting to come back. I think he was involved the other day, and he's he's back in today. I think from the from the eleven, mm-hmm. but Everton have got to go there and and be perfect. That's the only way about it. The only way Everton get anything is if they have a perfect day and City have a bit of an off day. That's the only way that that Everton can really look at getting anything out of the game. Just got to be solid, stay compact, try and hurt them from wherever we can get set pieces, try and hit them from there, balls into the box. It's just really, it's going to be a real, real, real big ask of these players to to go again, as they have been doing for long parts of the season. But I take kind of the performance at Anfield until until that penalty, until really until Canati should have been sent off. Evan, we're fantastic defensively. Evan put in a real, real good shift at the back. And that's, that kind of shift is what's needed the week the weekend from the players and from the coaching staff to to get anything. But if you get beat, it's not the end of the world. Even if Luton go on to beat Sheffield United, it's not the end of the world. You've then got two fixtures in Palace at home where you've got to target a win there. There's, there's no two ways about it. You've got to target a win. And Brighton away where they have won at, this team has won, already won at Brighton. They put five past them. And 
when they came to Goodison earlier this season, we should have won, really. We, we got really, really unlucky with with that Ashley Young own goal. So you can say Sean Dice knows how to play against the Zerby based on the evidence that we've had so far at them two games. So that's a game that you've got to target a return. I'm not saying a win, obviously, but you've got to target a return. And I never had a really good team away from home. So just wait and see. But there's fleet results that happen. But I'm for the City play today. They did the double over Man City last season. So these results happen in the season. But as I say, Evan have got to play the perfect game. They've got to be absolutely spotless in their performance and they've got to sw stay switched on. For If the game lasts 100 minutes, they've got to be switched on for 105. They've got to be switched on when they get back in the shower still because you never know with these teams that they are that good. Yeah, so City play tonight at the time of recording, 8 o'clock tonight. We played a half twelve on Saturday, so that's fifty odd hours extra rest. And I don't know if I'm clutching at straws. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there any is there any any way, any whales where that is a big factor in the game, do you think? I see what you're saying, but I just think the the gap in quality is that vast unfortunately. And I'm not it's not just between Everton and, and Man City, it's between most teams and Man City. The the chasm is huge. Yeah, you've only got to look at the home game where Everton looked like we were in in, in it for long periods and then City decided to take it up two or three gears and it, in, in the end they completely blew us out the water. Um, they've got so many options that they can fall back on. They can make things happen at the click of a finger. Um, so, you know, even if they even if they played the day before us, they could probably field, with their strength and depth, they could field another 11, which would still head into the game against Everton as favourites. So, unfortunately, we have got to be perfect. It's got to be one of them where we need, we might need another Damari Gray type worldie to rescue something for us, we're going to have to be absolutely bob on defensively. We may need to take one of these chances. So Calvert Lewin, whoever else is, is playing up front, is going to need. To, if, if a chance comes along, they're golden. We're going to have to take them. We're going to have to be really, really clinical and then hold on. But like like Paul said, the Everton's away record is right up there in terms of the top four or five best in the in the Premier League. Um, we're hard to beat. I can't see us getting absolutely blown away. We're massive underdogs. Yeah. Um, but it's not against the realms of possibility that we put in one of these real dogged professional performances and come away with something. I don't think it's impossible to it's get not something impossible. there because we've mentioned Palace then. I think they mm -hmm. do two all mm -hmm. because you were late penalty. So you can go there and, and if you have a go, but not too much of a go because you can't believe in them holes at the back because you'll just get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. But I think. If you have a bit of a goal, because you can't, you can't sit it, you can't, you can't sit in because you're sitting up essentially. Ninety-five minutes yeah. against City, they'll pick the two talented, they'll find the gaps in the spaces. You can't do it. So I think yeah. it is about getting that balance. It is about you know using the ball when we've got it. Um, you know, forcing set pieces, for example. Um, I think sitting in against anyone's dangerous, but against Man City, it, it's like a three-point suicide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I would have offered you maybe two points from the Spurs and the City game to come, do you think you would have taken that? Um, I think a lot of people were looking at the last three. Yeah, yeah, for Spurs and City, two yeah. points, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think people were looking at the Fulham, Spurs and um, City games as like a, a trio. Um, I, I'd have probably said three points out of those was what I was looking for. We're on two now, so a point against City gives us that return. Um, I was quite disappointed to knock them away from Fulham with the full three points. That's probably where we've been shortchanged a little bit. But listen, if we end up getting a point at Man City, the, the one, you won't find one Everton fan complaining about that. Um, and you've got to remember that other sides down there, have, I've still got to go to these places. So again, like Paul said there, even if Luton beat Sheffield United at home, it's not yeah. time for panic stations because the fixtures look different every single weekend. We're going to have bad weekends. Luton will have bad weekends. Um, I think we'll have more good ones than Loom. And and a couple more of the teams down there before the end of the season. I think we'll be all right still. Yeah, so obviously tough game, but John Dice must be having a headache because he doesn't really have that many options, to be honest. But in terms of selection, like what you go for? Do you go for the same again? Do you make some changes? I think it all depends on fitness levels of the rest of the players. Obviously, if Amadou Onana is fit to start for me, he comes into the eleven. Just gives us much more balance, just gives us much more presence in midfield. If we want to try and bully Man City in midfield, if we want to try and be horrible and we want to try and kind of make it a physical battle, you, you need them to do it. And I think we missed him a bit the weekend against Tottenham and definitely against against Fulham when we had no other no other fit midfielder far from James Garner. The other big question mark would be the right-back position. 
you stick with Ben Godfrey up against the likes of Doku, Grealish, Foden, whoever, whoever plays out there? Or do you go more experienced, maybe Seamus Coleman with Ashley Young in front of him? I think there's nine, nine, nine players that pick themselves, which would be the same. And the only big doubt would be who comes in midfield, who plays in midfield with James Garner and Idris Garnagay, and who plays at right back. I think for me, they are the the two biggest biggest question marks out of it was right now. I go Seamus Coleman and. Amadou Onana comes in for Dwight McNeil probably, and Ashley Young keeps his place at right wing because we're gonna need we're gonna need that uh, that that solidity defensively. Yeah, any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, I'd, I'd go with that. Um, I think Dwight McNeil looks really, really tired. Um, it was legs don't look like they can carry him properly through games at the minute. Um, I think he could benefit, and he's done a job. He's been asked to come in and do a job for for Everton in an unfamiliar position, and he's done okay. He's done fine, but obviously we're not seeing the best of him, and he looks really tired. So, if there's a chance to bring him out and 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 Arna's fit, it's fine. Um, I think the, there could be an option to even give Dobbin a start and pull a Jack Harrison out, for example. Um, just very conscious of a of a really big game coming up against Palace the week after. And I'm not saying this is like, oh, you know, just drop players because it's Man City or whatever. I think that's just being tactical and sensible with a small squad and maybe targeting games that are clearly on the calendar very, very important and ones that Everton should be winning. Um, but it's going to be a tough ask. Uh, obviously, there'll be a podcast de- dedicated to, um, you know, before Man City, but looking ahead, it's 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 a tough one. Um, but one that a Sean Dyche Everton wouldn't surprise me going away and getting something just because of the way we apply ourselves and the way a Sean Dice team are mentally and have proven themselves to be this season so far wouldn't wouldn't be as big a shock as it has been in the last couple of seasons, put it that way. Yeah, so thanks Lee, thanks Paul. And more importantly, thanks you guys for listening at home. So if you enjoyed the show, why not head over to our Patreon or check out our website, www.theviewforthembullens.co.uk for more pre-match, in-depth analysis, interviews and everything an Everton fan I'd ever want, really. Thanks a lot.